and special guest, William Kennedy. How's everybody doing today? It was a good day, right? Yeah. yeah. The best part is we get to drink some beer in about a half an hour, right? That's what you guys want, beer. I tend to walk around a lot. I might even come down here a little bit as I'm talking. Is this scary or what? <laughs> this usually freaks people out when I get... See, the back is always the front in my classroom. Here we are. How many of you come into the class tomorrow? I heard there's like 50 or 60 people tomorrow. Who's coming... That's it. What, what's wrong with everybody? Yeah, guys, got it's the weekend, right? I get it. All right, what I'm going to do is change it up a little bit. I was going to talk about interfaces, but we had a lot of um, lecture time type talks today, and that was great. We haven't had a lot of like live demo stuff, though. We just had one on testing, which was pretty cool. But I thought we'd end the day doing some live demoing around the profiling tool. How many of you have played with the profiling tool? really got their hands dirty. That's pretty good. That's about maybe 20% of the room. So this is great. The other 88%, we're going to have a little fun. And this is some of the stuff I do in my classroom. So you'll get a sense of what we're going to be doing tomorrow. But by the time we start looking at this stuff tomorrow, I'll really explain why you're seeing what you're seeing. And this is a good demo because you don't necessarily have to know everything right now to see how this tooling works. So we're going to start off with this project right here. Now, this is a project that I've built. I'm going to be going after Google really hard on this project. So let me make sure that um, we're going to copy over into this path here. Actually, I'm already there. I'm just going to build this project real quick. And we're just going to run it right here. We're about to launch this thing into the world. And I'm about to compete against Google because just like Google, we can search for anything. Well, not exactly. What this program does is it's going to download three RSS feeds. We're going to store that in memory for about five minutes. And we're going to search for things out of these, this news feed. I'm on the internet, so we're going to get the, the live feeds. And if you want to make sure you get news every single time you run this search engine, you only have to find out or ask what your friend is up to. <laughs> because he's all over the news. So, boom, this thing just ran. There it is. We've got results. BBC beat everybody else out this time. I was at CNN training a couple weeks ago, and they were very upset that their feed didn't beat out the other two. It was really funny. All right, so this app is working, right? We're good. We're ready to go. We want to put this thing in production, but it would be really nice to get a sanity check right now just to validate that our memory profiles are okay, that we're not leaking memory, that from a pro processing standpoint we can do this. It would be nice to put some load through this server, wouldn't it? Now, how many of you have ever played with the uh, variable called Go Debug? Go debug is a, he's laughing about go debug. Go debug's a cool little variable here. It's an environmental variable. The runtime loves this. We can get a couple different traces out of your Go programs without having to do anything just by looking at go debug. So what I'm going to do right here is I'm going to come back into my binary here. We're going to kill it for a second. Kill it. Go away. Clear it. And this time what I'm going to do is set the go debug variable. I'm going to set the GC trace to equal 1. And we're going to run this project again. And one other thing I'm going to do is I don't want to see standard out. OK, so I'm running the GC. I'm running my program again using GC trace. OK, let's just run a couple more searches. Let's make sure everything is still working when I do that. Let's see what happens here. I've run it. And you might notice right out of the box, just by hitting the search button, Two entries have now popped up on the screen. Let's take a look at what these mean. All right. So what we're looking at is a garbage collection trace. Every time the garbage collector runs, we're going to get a trace over here in standard out. Now, really quick, we can read this very quickly. GC12, that's how many G times the GC has run. That's how long the program was running, 13 seconds on that second GC. Now, the gar garbage collector is allowed to use up to 25%. Yes, 25% of your available CPU to do the job. We'll talk about more of that tomorrow. All we have to know about today is right now it used really 0% to get that work done. Not surprisingly, we haven't put any load through the server yet. Now, the next three numbers are interesting. Do you see the plus? 
that plus is dividing three numbers. Now that number right there, if you add all three numbers, that's how long the GC took. However, the two numbers on the end are really more important. That's our stop the world time. We'll talk tomorrow what those stop the world times actually are. But from our perspective right now on that second GC, we're looking at what? 76 microseconds of stop the world. That's okay. As long as we're under 100 microseconds, I don't really care. Now, that's the wall clock. The wall clock is that perceived time things took. The wall clock is enough for us when we're looking at this. Now, the next set of numbers is the same thing, but that represents the, this mic isn't working for me, or somebody's going to have to help me with this because I'm getting a lot of static. That right there also is the, the total time the GC ran from the CPU clock. You'll notice there's a lot more numbers just because the concurrent time, which is in the middle, the middle numbers is broken into the three phases. Okay, great. Now, those last three numbers that we see divided by arrows, that is the first number is the size of the heap when the GC started, size of the heap after the GC started, and then we're looking at the live heap. All right, so that's going to give us some information about what's happening on the heap when we do this load. Five, meg, that's gonna, uh, five megabytes, that's going to be our next goal. And 8P, that's how many logical processors or threads I'm running. Now, if you notice, because I've been just wind, wind bagging this right now, the garbage collector forced itself to run, which it will do if there's enough idle time. And you can see that it will drop down to a one meg heap. You're also seeing the scavenger run. And the scavenger will try to give memory back to the operating system over time. Brilliant. We've got an understanding of what this GC trace is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run some load through our server. We already got three GCs that ran here. Let's run 10,000 transactions through this server. Let's see how fast we're performing at that. And then we'll come back and look at this trace and just do a sanity check on our memory to validate that life is good. This is just giving us some kind of surface area understanding that we're not leaking memory and things seem to be OK. So what I'm going to do to run some load is I'm going to run a tool called Hey. Now, Yana over at Google built this tool. It's a nice little tool that does a lot in terms of telling us our requests per second, our distributions on latency, all that good stuff. So here we go. I'm going to run 10,000 requests through our server using 100 concurrent connections on that same search we just ran. And as you can see, there's a lot of garbage collection going on. Now, don't freak out that there's a lot of garbage collection going on. Remember, this is all running maybe within a millisecond or two, and we only have hopefully less than 100 microseconds of stop the world latency. So you're still running even though this is. That's the whole point. The idea is we want to keep that heap small enough where we're sharing those resources properly, but also that we're getting some performance here. Now, there's a lot of GC going on here. Now, I'm also trying to access feeds and things across the ponds or oh, far away. So I'm not surprised here. But here we go. I've never seen that many. Maybe I ran too much load through our server from something else I was doing. And I did. That's 100,000. That's not a good day here. I'm going to kill this. I ran the wrong command because this is what happens when you're doing live demos. And what we're going to do is kill hay. And we're going to fix this number to be 10,000 because that was crazy right there. So let's do it again, 10,000. Let's run this again. Here we go. I'm going to double check that we're still working by, double, by hitting our search. There's our 1GC. There's our 2. Perfect. Now let's just run 10,000 transactions through our server. That should, should only be about, I don't know, three or 4,000 GCs. There we are, about 3,000 garbage collections that we took minus a couple. So we're at 3,007 GCs to handle those 10,000 transactions. Now we can quickly look over at how our performance went during that run. And we can see here that we're running at about 1,659 requests a second. That's what our server's handling. Remember, the server's generating HTML on top of um, all of the other feed work it's doing. Okay. Not bad. Let's double check the Go debug here. Let's just validate a few things. Now, the very first thing I'm looking at is the last couple of GCs, because at this point, the load is over with, right? And what I want to make sure is that these numbers here were not growing. Now, if these numbers are constantly growing, you have a memory leak. If 
fact, if you tell me you have a memory leak and you're not showing me a GC trace, I'm going to ask you to run it. You can't really look at the operating system for this. You've got to come over and run this GC trace. So one of the first things I'm going to ask you is run this GC trace for some amount of time. Let's validate that these numbers are not growing over time. Notice that everything came back to 4 meg. If I go and I search up and I scroll through here a little bit, you can see overall we had some heap growth over time here. But overall, it's a pretty stable heap. There may be moments where we've had these, these types of bursts. Nothing here is screaming at me like, whoa, whoa. Now, another thing I might look at is the uh, wall clock just to see are we, most of the time, are we under that 100 microseconds of stop the world latency? And we are. That one's a, a pretty decent um, hit there, but I don't really have logs to kind of correlate back to that. But overall, we're under 100 microseconds. There's nothing crazy going on in this Go debug. I'm feeling pretty good that we can put this into production if we want it. But maybe there's some low hanging fruit in this server that we can find in terms of, let's look at allocations right now, that if we can remove very quickly, then maybe we'll get a little bit more performance out of this thing, huh? So the best thing to do is to try to get a memory profile of everything that we just looked at. And guess what? We can because I've already set this server up to give us that. Now, what I'm going to do is bring up another project real quick so you can see what I've already done inside of this project. It's just cleaner to look at it in my service project. So in my service project inside of main, I've done a couple of things here. I've added this endpoint. Let me switch this over to white because I forgot to do that. We're not on a screen where the dark is going to be our best option. OK. Nut preprop. You see that import that I just added there with, the, um, with that underscore, the blank identifier? Basically, what we're doing is we're asking the pprop package to initialize the default server mux to add a special endpoint now called debug pprof. Now that's great, you can add it to the default server mux, but we still have to bind the default server mux. So one of the things that you really should do in your servers, as long as they run behind the firewall, please, is use that default server mux purely for your debugging capabilities of your server. You can put this in any long running service that you have. It doesn't cost you anything until you hit it. And when you're hitting it, you need it. So we don't care about the cost at that point. So basically, look at what I'm doing here. I'm starting a server. I've got that default server mux bound as my handler. I'm going to put it against some port, which we already did. It's 3,000. And then we're just going to listen and serve on that there. So basically, if I don't do that, I now have this special endpoint in my server called debug pprof. There it is, debug pprof. I got this for free just by binding that default mux and, and um, well, calling the important and binding the default mux. How cool is this right here? I've got stats now of my server and everything I've already run through it. I already have a bunch of stuff. Now, this is the 1.11 view of debug pprof. This isn't new. It's been around a long time. They actually started adding some documentation to it, which is really cool. Now, a couple of things that you can look at here, and we're going to look at the heap profiles. But if you see everything that I have in red, that tends to be the things that I look at. So, Alex, that's actually a new endpoint now in 1.11. That is your heap profile. The Alex link there, that URL, is going to give us a heap profile and default into what's called an Alex space view of the profile. When you're looking for low-hanging fruit, we want that Alex space kind of view. So Alex is the one we're going to use. If you see heap, heap is the traditional old URL, but that uses what's called in use space when you're looking at the heap. And in use space is basically saying during the snapshot what's currently in the live heap. That's not helping me right now. I need to see every allocation, whether it's there or not. So our Alex URL is going to be good. Now that uh, go routine uh, link is also a really powerful one. You see how the number is nine? It's telling us how many go routines, regardless of what state they're in, that this program currently has. When I, when I took a snapshot here of hitting this URL, if I were to hit it again, it might change. It might. I know that we've got, um, I've got an eight virtual core machine, so there should be one there. 
uh, actually eight Go routines, so we ran some stuff, it's still there. But you know what's cool? One of the nice things about this link is if you had a memory leak, or even let's say really a Go routine leak, this view of the world can actually help you. Memory leaks are very hard to find in Go, but sometimes what's nice is you can bring this up and what it's going to do, you see that number there in front, it's going to tell you how many Go routines are kind of in the same place at the same time. And sometimes you can use this to help debug maybe a Go routine leak, something that's bad that's going on. It's kind of cool. Uh, hopefully you never have to click this link in your life. But know that it's there. It can give you an indication of what all of these Go routines are doing and what they're blocked on here. Okay. Um, and then you have really the ability to get a trace. You get the ability to also get a CPU profile. So think about this. If you hide this into your service behind the firewall and there's a problem going on in your service, you can look at a CPU profile right then and there, see what functions are, are taking the longest. Maybe that will help indicate what's going on. We can get these memory profiles right out of the box out of a server that's not behaving. Now, what I want is this right here. I want this URL right here. This is my heap profile using the Alex. So watch what I'm going to do here. Since I've already run load through my server, all I have to now do is bring up the, the pprof tool. Now to use pprof, I don't have to do anything more than this. Go tool pprof, but I have to feed pprof that heap profile. And right now that heap profile is coming from this URL. So boom, I hit there. And if you notice the type is Alex space, this is exactly where I want to be. So now what I have is the full memory profile of everything we've run through the server. Now remember, I'm looking for low-hanging fruit. I'm looking for anything that's maybe over-allocating where we could potentially remove those allocations. From a performance standpoint, I put GC as like number two in the all-time going to slow your Go program down. So allocations are a big deal in terms of performance. All right. So how do I start looking for low-hanging fruit? Well, I could ask the pprof, give me uh, the top 40 functions that are allocating and sort by that cumulative number, and I get this big list right here. Now, cumulative basically means that from this function call and all function calls that this function call makes and that one makes and that one makes, add up all these allocations all the way up to this point. If you notice right here, um, it looks like we've got RSS search at the very top of this list. Super interesting because basically that's a function that I wrote. It looks like to me that my function is eating up about five gigs of memory at any given time. It doesn't mean it's still there. Remember, these are allocations that probably got cleaned up, but still five gigs of allocations coming out of RSS search. I don't like that. So let's do the following here. Let's run a list command, RSS search. That just takes a regular expression, and we can get a sense of what's happening inside this function. Now, remember, we're looking for almost 5 gig of cumulative allocations here. This is what we're going after, 18 meg, way too small. We keep going here, 1.5 meg, way too small. Here it is, boom. So I've got almost five gigs of allocations occurring on this line of code. Hmm. All right, I don't want to guess because I basically have two function calls going on here. I've got a call to contains and a call to to lower. And it might be obvious to some of you, but I never like to guess. I want to know which one this is. So what I'm going to do, we've run the top command already to look at those top functions looking for the low hanging fruit. We found one. I ran a list command to get to that source code to look at where that number is coming from. It's a cumulative number on this call. Now I want to get a general sense of what's happening underneath this. So one of the things I can do next is issue a web call. The web call is going to give me a call graph. And what I can also do is say, filter this call graph for just things related to RSS search. And now this call graph comes up. It's just RSS search related. Let me give you a sense of what happens if I don't filter it. I'm going to get a much larger graph. I don't want that. I just want the small one. And what does the graph tell me? Too lower 
is doing all of the damage for me. So this is interesting. Within, what, five or ten minutes of me even talking, I found a place in my program that's probably not allocating the way we were over-allocating, and maybe it's something we can clean up. Okay, let's go look at the source code for this. And if we go back to the, the code right here, we're going to find that RSS is right here. Now, something you should know about this code. I wrote this code a couple of years ago for some other training work I was doing. And I was using this code. And when I decided I wanted to start learning how to do profiling, I decided to use this because it was a complete app. So I wrote this code on purpose. This is what I did. I did not write it for this demo. When I saw this for the first time, I couldn't believe it, right? Because here I am, Go developer, writing code, getting things to work. Never ran the tooling against that code. And as you can see, you should all walk out of the room and take my Go card away. Because look at what I'm doing in this piece of code here. What this code does is it's in a loop. And it's searching through all those um, RSS documents, looking for anything that contains that term for the description. And inside this loop, I am calling to lower over and over and over and over and over again, which basically means that to lower is allocating over and over and over and over and over again. And this is all transient allocations, and there's a large number of them. And not only are we just causing our, our live heap to hit the top of the heap quicker, it's also a lot of different values that the garbage collector has to go through. This is crazy. It's even crazier when you think that I already told you, I cache this stuff ahead of time. We download these feeds every five minutes. So technically, if I do this work before we cache it, I could get rid of all these allocations, right? Yeah, I could. So what's nice is right above this code here is where we do the cache set. So this is the code that's doing the get, it's grabbing that, and then it's putting it in the cache. So what if we just took a little code here for a second, came up here. Now maybe we'll use our pointer semantics here, and we'll say the following. Before we get to the cache, now ideally, yes, I should create a new field for this. I don't have time. We're on stage. Ideally, I shouldn't be destroying um, my description, but we're going to do it anyway. So, what am I doing here now? I'm saying no problem, let's do the two lower work up front when we download it, then let's put it in the cache. That's awesome. Once that's done, now I can come back to the code that's causing me my heartache, and I can get rid of at least all of these allocations right there. Plus, the description's pretty large, so it's, it's, this is a really bad thing I'm doing. What's even sillier is the term. At least the description was different on every iteration. This wasn't even different. Like, you want to talk about wasteful allocations. It doesn't get any, any worse than that. So look at what I've just been able to do thanks to the tool finding something that I just kind of missed because I was working fast and trying to get things to work, and I was happy that it worked, and I never went back. I now just got rid of about five gigs of allocations, didn't I? I think so. So what we now have to do is build this thing and run it again and see what happens. So let me save it. Let me come back in here. Let's kill this server. Now remember we had 3,000 and let's just use the number 14 GCs when we ran this one. So let's go, go build. Brilliant. What do I have? A bug. None of you helped me with this. Shame on all of you. I forgot this. Here we go. Go build. Brilliant. And we're going to run this again. We're going to make sure that this is still working. So let's do that. We've got our one. We've got our two. Brilliant. Now we're at 1660. We'll round that up. 1660. All right, 1660 with a little over 3,000 GCs. Hmm, that can't be over yet. Wow. Look at our requests per second just by getting rid of those allocations. We cut our GCs more than half. We doubled our time. 
It only took me about 15 minutes or so, and all because we just asked the tools to find that lowest hanging fruit. We talk about the garbage collector, and it's brilliant, and I don't want to get rid of it because one of the reasons I stopped programming in C and moved to C Sharp was because I was tired of all that, right? And I'm really happy about the garbage collector. That being said, we have to be very smart about the allocations because they're not free at any level. And the allocations that are serving us well, absolutely, we'll take the cost for that. But the ones that aren't, well, we've got to be really smart. Now, I got rid of those allocations, right? It would be kind of cool maybe to get a CPU profile at this point. Maybe there's something now on the CPU side that could be interesting, huh? Now, to get a CPU pro profile out of this program, I've got to run a little bit of load. And the default amount of time that the um, profile wants to run is about 30 seconds. I don't want to run for that long. So what we're going to do here is if I go back to our pprof here, we have that uh, profile link. So instead of doing beep, we're going to do profile. I'm going to need some quotes in this one, I think. I always mess this up because profile has something called seconds. And I don't want to run for more than five seconds. So this time, I've got to run a little bit more load so we can run for at least five seconds. So let me move this to 100,000. OK, we're running some load through the server now. When you're doing a CPU profile, you have to do it when there's load running on the system. It is now fetching five seconds worth of CPU profiling. There we go. I got my five seconds. That's perfect. Let me just kill that load, because if I don't, my fan's going to start to kick in. There we go. Now I can do the same thing. Give me the top 40, sort by that cumulative number. And this time I'm seeing a lot of things starting at the connection level. That makes sense. I've got our server mucks. I've got other things going on here. And it looks like when I get to the top 40, it's all template-related stuff, isn't it? But if I wanted to just focus on my RSS search, RSS search, I could list it again and look at what we can do to fix it. Now, there's about two seconds here of time that we're spending in RSS search. And if we go back, now it's telling us what? Well, 950 milliseconds of that. The majority of it is on your call to strings contain. And all of you should be like, Bill, if you're really trying to do anything that's comparing, this is the last package you should be using anyway, right? Probably. So what is this telling us? It's telling us, Bill, if you want to improve the performance of this function anymore, now you've got to start thinking about how to change the algorithm efficiencies and get rid of that call as well. Pretty cool stuff, huh? The tooling in Go is absolutely crazy. And in the workshop tomorrow, what we're going to really do is focus on understanding the things that you do in the language that have these costs, being able to read code at a, almost at a line level and be able to say, yep, that line's going to give us this cost, that line's going to give us that cost. Then we come back into this tooling. It's not, going to, it's not going to be shocking. And even if it is surprising and we go, whoa, 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 where did that allocation come from? Why is that thing? We'll have enough information then to dig in and start fixing that code to get rid of them if it's reasonable and practical to do so. So I love just showing off the Go tooling as much as I can because it's something that they knew about from day one and they built this up. And what's very cool as well, by the way, and I didn't do this, I was on the command line, but if we go back to your, uh, if I go back to that heap profile, you're going to make me do it right here. If you do this, and this is great, and uh, they started this in 1.10, and it's improving in 1.11, uh, I can use 3,000. If you add this HTTP flag to the pprof today, what you now get is a GUI for all this stuff. This is a great place to start because you don't have to worry about um, memorizing. I'm going the wrong way. Memorizing all of those commands that I gave you. Again, you can see here that the call graph came right up, but there's your top command. Look at that. There it is. There's your top command right out of the box. They even got these flame graphs for you out of the box. You don't have to do that manually anymore either from here. That peak is 
um, what we were doing here. So uh, source, show me the source. RSS search. Here we go. Give it to me. <laughs> so I do a lot on the command line only because I've been using this tooling for a long time. And there's some other things I can do on the command line pretty, pretty um, quickly that I'll show tomorrow as well. But if you're brand new to this stuff, guess what? This is going to be excellent. You can just jump into the UI. They're improving it all the time. You just got to add this flag and you're all set. Really, really cool stuff that they're doing. And by the way, too, um, I can show you this stuff tomorrow. If you're using the, the web view like this, you can also get things down to the assembly line. Wow, yeah. If I bind the binary, hey, you want to try that? I haven't tried that. We got time, right? Let's, let's experiment with something here. This would be cool. Prop, I believe, let's see if this works. This could totally fail. I'm including the binary here, right? Let's see if, if this totally, oh man, it totally failed here, HGP. Let's do it after the switch, hold on. I haven't tried this yet, hold on a second. Let's try it after the switch. This could be cool if it works. Let me see if it works. If I include the binary, come on, work for me. If I include the binary for RSS search um, source, no, you're not going to do that for me. Oh, there you go. Oh. Oh. Pretty cool stuff. And if you are uh, generating uh, these uh, heap profiles from your Go test tool, by the way, when you run Go test and you say, give me a memory profile, the testing tool will generate two files for you. It will generate your, your out file for the profile, but it generates a, a binary with the dot .test extension on it. So you can do this. You get all the way down into the, yeah, that's the assembly line right there, the make slice call that's causing that. This is cool stuff, isn't it? And it's all here in this browser-based UI, and it's just getting better and better and better. So tomorrow, what we're going to do is really learn how to be able to jump back in here. We'll do some hands-on stuff. I'll show you how to generate profiles from, from the standard library. I'll show you how to generate profiles from running benchmarks. We'll do some of that by hand. But in the morning, we're going to learn what we need to to be able to interpret this a little bit better. So we're, about, we're smarter when we go in. But even if you don't know all of that, how quickly did we find something that we were able to fix? Yeah, it's cool stuff. All right, so hopefully you guys enjoyed this little demo. Sorry I didn't talk about interfaces, but I thought you guys needed a, a demo at the end of the day here. Yeah, cool stuff. All right, guys, thank you so much for having me. And the organization's been great. Appreciate it. Thank you, Bill. Any questions? You guys are going to ask me questions over whiskey, okay? okay? No questions up here. So you find me after you can ask all the questions you want. All right, we're good. No questions. Nah. Yeah. So let's let's collect all speakers here on the skin.